Good evening, everyone. My name is Yvonne Hunter, and I'm the head of programming here at the Appel Salon at the Toronto Public Library. It is thrilling to see so many people out this evening, um, so welcome. It's my pleasure to, uh, to bring to the stage tonight Dr. Norman Doidge, who many of you may know from his, his previous book, and uh, Nora Young, CBC Sparks Nora Young, uh, for a conversation. For centuries, it was believed that the price we paid for our brain's complexity was that it was fixed and unregenerative. Norman Doidge has turned this idea on its head with his groundbreaking first book, The Brain That Changes Itself. I was fortunate to be part of the publishing team that worked on that book and witnessed its remarkable reception. He presented an idea with profound implications, the idea that the brain can change, potentially discover new pathways, and heal itself, recovering from conditions including stroke, ADD, Parkinson's, and dementia. This is the phenomenon of neuroplasticity. As a journalist, author, and speaker, Nora Young explores how new technology shapes the way we understand the world around us. She is the author of The Virtual Self, a book that looks at the explosion of data and how it affects our behaviors. Please join me in welcoming the CBC's Nora Young. Hi. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, welcome. It's a, a delight to be here. Um, I'm just going to, before I introduce Norman and we get the, the ball rolling, I'd like to just give you a quick overview of um, the, how the evening's going to go. I'm going to be interviewing Norman Doidge for about 45 minutes, and after that we're going to have a Q&A from uh, you. So as you listen, I hope you'll be thinking of um, questions that you want to answer, things that you wish I'd asked, and so forth. Um, and, you know, just take the time to remember, we don't have a lot of time, so it would be super helpful if people could keep their questions concise. Um, that way we can get as many questions in as we possibly can. And uh, I would say that, unfortunately, Norman is not able to answer specific medical questions. These things are very particular, and we want to keep the conversation of benefit to everyone. So please bear that in mind uh, during the Q&A and, again, during the book signing. All right, so on to our uh, guest of honor here tonight. Norman Deutsch is a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst, and he's the author of the enormously influential book, The Brain That Changes Itself, about neuroplasticity, and now this new book is out called The Brain's Way of Healing, which I could barely put down over the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, where he documents extraordinary examples of healing and treatment from such diverse problems as Parkinson's, brain injury, and MS. And he's one of our own, a Torontonian. So won't you please welcome Norman Deutsch. Um, so Norman, let's start with a couple of basics. What do we mean by this idea of neuroplasticity? And how is that different from our conventional understanding of the brain? Sure. Uh, neuro is for neuron, the nerve cells in the brain that generate electrical signals or patterns of information. Uh, and these patterns of information constitute the lingua franca of the brain. We've often focused on, on the chemicals in the brain. And they generate signals too, but at a very local level. So the language spoken by the chemicals use a metaphor would be like a dialect. Uh, but the neurons are really broadcasting uh, vast arrays of signals throughout uh, the expanse of cortical real estate and throughout the entire brain. And um, plastic it means adaptable, changeable, and modifiable. And so neuroplasticity is that property of the brain, and this is what's so neat about it, that allows it to change its structure and function in response to activity and mental experience of many kinds. So for the longest time, we thought that uh, the mind was what the brain, the mind is what the brain does, uh, because changes to brain structure led, led to changes in mental experience in some way. But now we discover that changes in mental experience can lead to changes in brain structure. So that's why it's so revolutionary, um, especially because our notion of brain circuitry and the brain in general was that after early childhood, it didn't change. Mm -hmm. um, and we always saw the brain, ever since Descartes 
with a, a very machine-like metaphor. He, he saw it as a hydraulic machine, which, was, which were very impressive machines uh, 400 or so years ago. And then with the invention of electricity, we started to see it as an electrical machine and sp still speak of circuits. That's, a, that's really a metaphor. They're not quite circuits. Yeah. Um, and of course, now, the sort of master analogy is that the brain is a computer. Um, when we spoke of circuits, the fixed notion of the brain was that um, the circuitry was hardwired. It was formed and finalized in childhood. Now that it's a computer, the metaphor has been, and there, by the way, there are very intelligent people who pursue the idea that the brain is a biological computer very seriously. And in that metaphor, thought is seen as somehow like software. Mm -hmm. And the structure of the brain is uh, hardware. And the only change that hardware undergoes is it wears out over time. You use it and you lose it. So the governing idea of this book, The Brain's Way of Healing, is that stimulating the brain using generally some sort of energy and mental awareness can actually help in a range of, of problems. So can you expand on that idea? Sure. Um, after I finished The Brain That Changes Itself, uh, for, for that book, I had to go out and seek out stories. I, I went to uh, um, the library at U of T originally and started reading and then contacting people who were doing relevant research, and then it became a question of, of uh, immersion in their work. But after The Brain That Changes Itself uh, came out, a lot of stories also began coming to me, so it was, it was a two-way thing. And I started to notice certain themes in the stories, and they fit with something that I had worked out in The Brain That Changes Itself, but not expanded. It was, it was amazing the extent to which a lot of the new interventions by the second generation of neuroplasticians, as I call them, um, a, a generation that wasn't burdened with proving that the brain was plastic, um, it was amazing the extent to which their work also involved mental work and energy in some way. And it fit very well with just the following notion. Um, the thing I have said about neurons, you know, we, we have all sorts of experiences of, you know, we, we see images, uh, we hear sounds, we enjoy fragrant odors, but there are no images or sounds or odors in the brain. There are these patterns of electrical energy. And it became apparent to me that you could influence these patterns of electrical energy in a very simple way, non-invasively through the senses or the body. So some of our senses are what are called transducers. Probably they all are. And a transducer is an, a, an engineering term for something which turns energy of one form into energy of another form, or patterns of energy of one form into patterns of energy in another form. So sound comes in the cochlea, sound waves with the patterns of energy there. They're converted by the cochlea into electrical patterns of energy. And because the brain is plastic, it became apparent that you could influence the structure of the brain, not just with thought, which is one of the things I emphasized in the first book, and mental practice and rehearsal, but with sense experience as well. And of course, the retina is a transducer of light to electricity and so on. And it, it became a there were examples of people using light uh, for, to treat traumatic brain injury, actually here in Toronto, brilliant examples, uh, using sound for learning disorders and autism, uh, sensory processing disorder, movement for, there's a story of a girl who was born missing a third of her cerebellum, and just movement as a way, of moving the limbs mm. as talking to the brain, actually took this girl who was supposed to be paralyzed and institutionalized, and she's an, a, just a perfectly normal adult now. Um, and so the other thing I found was that a lot of the neuroplasticians who were doing this work, when I would be talking to them, because you know this becomes a very, per these, these encounters become very personal, yeah. because these people have been isolated, um, dismissed, 
um, abused. They've had trouble getting grants for, you know, for many years, particularly their mentors, because this was outside of the paradigm. And people don't believe uh, in general, who, once you're stuck in what I call the doctrine of the unchanging brain, which grew up uh, in response to this notion of the fixed brain, you know, many conditions, one patient after another, let's put it this way, in this book was told they wouldn't get better. Yeah. And if they did get better working with these people, um, then often people would hear those stories and they wouldn't believe that they were really sick in the first place, even though it had been very well documented. Uh, so it became personal because we'd all had these unusual experiences of people uh, who weren't supposed to get better, getting better. And um, I learned that a lot of them were actually into various forms of traditional Eastern medicine in their private lives, or martial arts, or yoga, or Tai Chi. And although all of the energy interventions in this book are based on Western neuroscience, based on, based on equations that you, you, know, you can measure in terms of Western neuroscience, um, it was very clear that Eastern medicine had, you know, for millennia, taken the notion of energy very seriously and mind. Eastern medicine hadn't done nearly as brilliantly in documenting the brain. We're very good in the West of analyzing it into parts and saying what occurs where and so on. Um, but the clinical use of energy, you know, in the meridians and tra uh, traditional Eastern medicine or in Tai Chi and so on, and mind together were front and center. And this was, of course, what was happening as I was looking at all these various interventions. Mm -hmm. and you actually make the point at one uh, point in the book that um, neuroplasticity is sort of offers the opportunity for these two grand uh, traditions, the Eastern and the Western medical tradition, to in fact come together and um, perhaps form some, some type of new approach. I, I, I very, very much hope that that occurs yeah. because I think there are very valuable things in both. And, um, you know, I myself, you know, I remember being with people describing their Eastern medicine ex experiences and energy, and I would try to get them to explain what was meant by energy. and. Um, in general, they had a lot of difficulty. They, they, sometimes if they were very advanced in Tai Chi or something like that, they, they would describe physical sensations. But I struggled with it too, uh, for sure. And you know, I've since looked into it too. And I do Tai Chi. And um, these are very difficult to describe concepts in, West, in Western medicine. But what is becoming completely clear to me, or has become clear to me, is that we have this really funny um, attitude in Western medicine towards, towards energy, I think, in clinical practice. Because you know, there's a lot of eye rolling that goes on when people hear about these energy-based interventions. Um, we're very focused on use of medication and, and surgery. And there's, there's room for those, of course. Um, but it, it just became clear that you know, in medical school, for instance, you may have to take a, a, a physics course to get into medicine, but mm -hmm. you don't really study physics in medicine. And the eye rolling occurs because there really is very little emphasis in clinical practice. And yet, what is the most common symptom in all of clinical practice? It's an energy symptom. It's fatigue. Right. That's really interesting. Um, and the other thing is, sometimes when people are suspicious of energy medicine and think it sounds very flaky. And sometimes people describe it in a very flaky way. I, I don't deny that. I sometimes cringe at the way people describe <laughs> it. Um, the fact is, you know, a skeptic usually will come and say, well, I want to see that on an fMRI or I want to see an x-ray or something like that, proving that what you say the changes made were possible. But what is an fMRI and what is an x-ray? They're energy assessors. Hmm. X-rays are rays, and fMRIs use magnetism. And in fact, in all of our um, assessments, the, the people who develop those machines and assessing tools are, are very much into quantum physics and lasers and all of that. And, but in clinical practice, we don't make very much use of those concepts. Hmm. 
So in the book, you travel all over the world and you meet people who have had these really astonishing results using various techniques. And I'd like to just talk about uh, one specific example because it's so common, which is chronic pain. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, maybe you could just briefly say, like, what is going on in the brain when we develop not acute pain, but chronic pain? Okay. So acute pain, everybody knows what that is, and it's protective. It basically says a limb has been injured, and don't, usually it's something like don't move because you could injure it further. And there are about a dozen areas in the brain. The signal is sent up to about a dozen processing areas. Um, and they fire, a little, we'll call it a little pinprick if you were looking on an, an fMRI or some kind of scan. Chronic pain is not the same as having um, a, a bunch of acute pains. When physicians talk about chronic pain, they mean there has been injury both to the limb and to the pain system itself. There are some terrible central pain problems where some of the pain maps are firing, and there's perhaps not much going on in the body. So chronic pain seems to be more central. And what usually happens is this. You know, from the first book, there are plenty of examples of people refining their senses. And because the brain is plastic and the senses are plastic, um, they develop more circuitry um, for sense, uh, for, for, as, as their sense perception becomes more differentiated and subtle, they, be, they develop more circuitry for that. So we know brass players have areas of the brain that uh, measure the timbre of brass sound that's expanded. So plasticity is a blessing if you want to cultivate one of those senses. But it's a curse um, with pain, which has sense-like qualities, of course. And if a nerve is constantly impinged upon over and over and over again, the brain gets, in quotes, better at, per at perceiving pain and hypersensitive so that um, if the area is, if the acute area, was, let's say, was just a, a small part of a nerve, as occurs with Michael Moskowitz, who I describe in the book, um, initially, as the nerve was impinged upon over and over, instead of the pain lasting you know, just a, a few seconds or minutes, it could last a day. And instead of just covering you know, part of the vertebra, it extended to his entire neck, his shoulders, his head, and his upper back. The chronic pain is plasticity gone wild. Right. So what did he do to, to deal with that? So, well, he had two lessons in pain. Um, he's, a, he's a real Huck Finnish kind of guy. <laughs> if you meet him. I mean, I first met him in a situation where he was very serious in, in a suit uh, at the American Academy of Pain Medicine. And he's an examiner, and he, he writes the exams for pain medicine. And, um, but there was this hugely boyish quality to this 60-year-old man as well. And it was the 4th of July a number of years ago. And he couldn't resist the pleasure of going to the San Rafael dump in California where the, uh, they were storing a bunch of tanks for uh, the 4th of July parade. And he climbed up on one, and then he jumped off, and his corduroys caught, and he heard three pops. And it was the sound of the femur, the longest bone in the body, cracking. And as he lay there on the ground, uh, bleeding into his thigh, so that his thigh had actually expanded to the size of his waist, he had a 10 out of 10 pain, which uh, that's pain medicine speak for being dropped in boiling oil. And he realized that he could bear it. And then he thought, what am I going to do on Monday for work? And then he noticed that if he lay still, perfectly still, for a whole minute, the pain disappeared. And he said, oh my god, it's true. What I've been teaching is true. because." He had been teaching the, what's called the gate theory of pain, which is a, um, the most important article in the history of pain was written by, co-authored by a Canadian. And it, it showed that there were actually gates in the spinal cord all the way up to the brain, like switches that could stop the signal from getting to the brain. And of course, you know, we've all, many of us have seen this in action when President Reagan was shot. 
He just kind of stood there, and nobody knew he'd been shot. And then he was pushed into the car, and he said after, um, you know, I'd been shot many times in the movies, and I always thought it hurt, so I acted like it hurt. But now I discover <laughs> that it, it doesn't always hurt. Um, and again, sometimes the brain can turn, turn it off. So that was a really crucial um, insight, a visceral insight. He, he knew it in theory. So many of the things in the book are things we all know in theory, like that the language of the brain or the main language of the brain is patterns of energy. We all know it, but how do you use it? Mm -hmm. So he had known, and every pain physician had known that there were these switches in the brain. But here he was, conscious. And his brain somehow did, for him, what he had been trying to do with all his chronic pain patients, with medication, with acupuncture, with, I mean, um, injections uh, of anesthetic. So for the rest of his life, he would know there are switches. The second thing that happened was um, this Huck Finn, uh, way past an age when it might have been suitable, was water skiing with his daughters in an inflatable tube, having um, a heck of a time. And he flipped over, and he injured his neck. And he developed a chronic pain syndrome, just like I described. It was at first acute, and then it became chronic. And it was really bad. Uh, he had pain eight out of 10 many days. He couldn't work. He was quite overwhelmed by it. And it, so, it happened roughly around the time uh, that neuroplasticity was coming into the literature. And he then devoured everything on plasticity, about 15,000 pages. And then he started to put things together. Um, so there are about a dozen areas in the brain that process pain. It's not as some people think, that there's a discrete area for pain. And of course, you may have noticed that when you are in pain, you might not be as emotionally regulated as you normally are. Yes. <laughs> uh, a, little, a little cranky, yeah. <laughs> uh, trouble concentrating, higher, maybe with some trouble with higher math or doing complex visual imagery and so on. And that's because there's an area that processes pain and emotional regulation and another pain and attention. And there's, there are a couple of areas in the brain that actually process pain and visual imagery, strangely enough. Now, when he studied the brain scans of the brain that wasn't in pain, the brain that was in acute pain, and the brain that was in chronic pain in these areas, what he found is the movement from acute to chronic pain involved a hijacking of those dual maps. So the, let's say the map for both pain and visual imagery, an extra 20% would be devoted to pain processing, if you will. So he had the following thought. He knew that plasticity is competitive. Um, I mean, that was shown in a number of experiments. But you know, for instance, if an animal has a map for this finger, this finger, this finger, this finger, and this finger, and it loses a finger, then what will happen is the map space in the brain devoted to processing for this finger will be devoted to this finger or some other activity. So he thought, what if every moment I get a pain, I, I force myself to visualize? Now this is like a really key point. It didn't matter what he visualized, um, but he chose to visualize something that would keep him on task, because this had never been done, as far as he knew. He chose to visualize those three pictures of the brain, in no pain, with nothing lighting up on a scan, in acute pain, with sort of pinpricks in a 12, almost a dozen areas, and then in chronic pain, where those pinpricks become like supernovas. And he imagined just turning it down. But the, it didn't matter that he was doing that. It was just a way of telling himself, Moskowitz, you're not completely crazy. There are switches in the brain. The brain can be in different states. Keep visualizing. And he, he got virtually no results in the first week or two. But then he, he had really just seconds of being free of pain. And by the way, he'd been on, he was on medication, too, and it just wasn't touching him. And at the end of several months, he got a period he could measure. I think it was you know, a number of minutes. And it took him the course of a year so that every time he had an attack, he just switched into intensive uh, visualization. And he was pain-free. 
and off all medication. So he, now he had something. And he began using it with a number of patients. And I, you know, I met with a, a, a number of his patients, and um, some of them completely came off medication. These were people, by the way, who'd had chronic pain syndrome sometimes for a decade or more. I mean, and nothing was touching it because the, the medications actually often fail because the brain is plastic and adapts to them. Right. So um, that's a story of chronic pain and someone actually using the mind to get over it. Sometimes he uses energy too. Mm -hmm. But he's also an example of you know, a number of the people that we encounter in this book of people who are dealing with very serious things that completely hijack their lives. Mm -hmm. So to what extent is this something that you know, you have to be extremely focused and basically dedicate your life to getting well, or to what extent is this something that, you know, maybe I'm not eight out of 10 in pain, but I have a chronic pain problem. Is this something that you can do, I hate to say more casually, but more casually? Um, when you are doing the visualization, you cannot be casual. You really have to use full concentration or it won't work. Um, but if you're asking the sort of character logical question, do you have to be unusually conscientious. I would say the first generation of people who are doing this outside of paradigm right. have to be very open-minded. And that doesn't mean uncritical. It just means the ability to think with different models and extremely conscientious and diligent because no one else is doing it and probably everyone thinks you're crazy. Right. But once it becomes established that it works, um, you don't have to be all that open-minded because um, you're not the trailblazer. And what you have to do is you have to find some motivating factor to get you to visualize. And with chronic pain, there's always a motivating factor. Yeah, yeah. You have a master who reminds you. So once you, you know, I met a number of his patients and they were, you know, were all ranges of intelligence and ranges of, you know, discipline and conscientiousness. And they were able to do it, um, again, with his support. Mm -hmm. A lot of the uh, treatments that people pursue in the book involve uh, various types of exercise or movement, and specifically a level of consciousness about how people are moving. So why is that so important? Um, well, you know, we've had a view of the brain, which has been very modular. And in some ways, it is the great triumph of uh, 19th and 20th century neurology and neuroscience to start saying where things occur. But we've tended to overdraw the modules. You know, senses towards the back, sensings towards the back of the brain, and action, movement, goal-directed behavior is towards the front. Um, so. Why would sensing be so important in helping people develop normal movement? Because the circuitry really is not nearly as modular as, as people think. Uh, the, the great neurosurgeon and neuroscientist who just passed away a, a couple of days ago, Carl Perbram, uh, who I had the, you know, really the honor of spending a lot of time with, had actually discovered that there were some sensory cells Interspersed in the moral, in, 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 interspersed in the motor cortex that governs movement at the front of the brain, um, and the circuitry of sensing is just these sensory motor circuits are, are very much involved. So, you know, there's a serious argument to be made that the, re, the one of the main reasons we have brains is because we move. There, there's an undersea animal that has a brain in the first part of its life, it's moving around, then it attaches itself to a, a rock and stays still for the rest of its life, and its stomach gobbles up its brain and much of its <laughs> nervous system. You don't need it anymore. Now, sensory systems, I think, also evolve to deal with the fact that we're moving, and awareness can change the quality of movement in the most profound way. Um, and we see this with meditation, awareness of, of certain emotion without trying to change it is often the best way to change it. So this hasn't been at the front and center of Western neuroscience, but it's been the front and center of traditional um, Eastern practices, including uh, Tai Chi and yoga and, and, and the meditative arts. 
Um, it just seems to be that the, the way we, be, becoming aware of movement is, you know, a technique can, that can lower high muscle tone, for instance, without trying to, you know, knead it with, with massage and so on. Um, awareness becomes really important in the Parkinson's case of John Pepper. So he, he was a guy, in a different but subtle way, he was a man who was diagnosed in, sorry, he had his first Parkinson's signs in his early 30s. Michael J. Fox had that experience, unfortunately. And he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. At the time, he was doing a lot of physical exercise for his back. And he would go at everything quite zealously and fiercely and working very hard. And the Parkinson's was getting the better of him. And he could lift fewer, you know, fewer and fewer pounds over time, et cetera. He was put on the usual Parkinson's medications, including L-DOPA. Uh, and initially, he had a good response to it. But then he started to get side effects. And the response started to wane. Um, he was very, very depressed for a couple of years, too. Um, and he, he just had this kind of epiphany that he had been feeling sorry for himself and allowing himself to experience himself as, as the victim of fate. And that hadn't been his way. And then he had a very, uh, you might argue, simple-minded idea, but time will tell. He said, I've got a movement disorder. Maybe what I should do is do everything I can to move while I still can. And as it happened, his wife had wanted to lose a few pounds. And there was this wonderful program in South Africa called Run Walk for Life. And in that program, they, they've taken many sedentary people, many sick people, and got them walking. And the essence of it is you can only walk 10 minutes every other day as you start. And then a couple of weeks has to elapse and lapse and uh, elapse, I guess. And then you go on to 15 minutes and 20, and you build up very, very slowly. This went against his character. Um, he wanted just to get in, and he said, I already do aerobics. Anyway, he went on walks with his wife, Shirley, and he obeyed. Um, <laughs> and one day, one of the supervisors, not knowing he had Parkinson's, said, you know, Pepper, you're stooped. Stand up straight. You know, pull your shoulders back. And he did that, and he actually found that he had to concentrate to do it, but it worked better for him. And so one of the things that happens in Parkinson's, two things that happen in Parkinson's are the following. Um, there's a part of the brain called ba the basal ganglia. And its function is to knit together individual movements into automatic sequences. And you know, we think of walking as just something natural. But for human beings, you actually have to learn how to walk by your mistakes. And if you watch a kid learning to walk, they're really doing one thing at a time, right? They're, lifting the thigh and then about to fall over and put up, swinging it forward and then putting their foot down. So those kinds of activities are, are very challenging in Parkinson's because they're automatic or brushing your teeth or getting dressed in the morning. So what he started doing was concentrating on every little detail. He called it his conscious walking technique. And I, I've since met a man um, from the United States who in parallel had developed that kind of approach. And it seems to be using the frontal lobes to walk instead of using a lot of the basal ganglia circuitry. So he started to do this with a lot of things. He did bizarre things, like if he was um, drinking and he had a terrible tremor, like this kind of thing, he would reach around the back of the glass and he could bring it up to his lips without the tremor. It was using a different kind of circuitry. But the most important part of it was that it turns out that walking triggers neuronal growth, brain growth factors, and growth factors that support the connections between neurons and the infrastructure of the brain, the glial cells. And so if you get an illness where you can't move around, you're deprived of that. And it's a use it or lose it brain because it's plastic. So you start to lose that. So the fact he developed this 
unusually intensive way of walking allowed him to get the benefits of walking. And now we, I, I document this in the book, and I know some people have trouble believing it and think Pepper is a one-off perhaps, but there's just a number of studies out now. Um, and the, the, the assessments of the literature by the Mayo Clinic and, and others are now showing that indeed um, exercise um, has a significant impact in reducing um, Parkinsonian movement problems, diminishing them, and the mood problems that go with Parkinson's. Right. So from a practical point of view, how do we, I mean, some of the stuff that you're talking about, the treatments that you're talking about, is by definition outside of the normal conventions of what, you, what a doctor would typically tell you to do. How do you assess the truth claims of some of these things? I mean, if somebody is saying, you know, listen to this type of music or whatever, how do I know that you know the treatment for the, that is promising that's going to uh, you know offer neurostimulation? How do I assess whether that's going to work for me? Whether that's not snake oil? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, I'll tell you how I assess it. Um, I spent some people ask me why it took me eight years um, to write my book, and I, I wrote the person back an explanation and signed it unprolifically yours, Norman <laughs> Deutsch. Um, it's because I immersed myself in these. Um, you know, by de science by definition has stages. And the initial stages might be, I mean, it's, it's often by a very curious person who's filled with wonder. They hear something that's unusual. Um, and instead of being dismissive about it, which is what I would call the immature skeptical response. Um, and let me explain that because, I mean, I actually came at this from skepticism, if I may say. Um, the, Im the, the immature skeptical response, and we've all had it, um, is something has happened, we believe something that we didn't really understand and we got taken. Um, and we all get taken. I understand that. And then we, to protect ourselves, take this attitude when something new comes along. If it doesn't fit with what I already know, um, I'll be dismissive of it. And of course, we go through life and we find we miss out on a few things by doing that. And if we're lucky, we don't completely give up skepticism. What we do is we come, become a little skeptical of our own skepticism and see that it doesn't always work. And we come to the realization that in this very complicated world, uh, the immature skeptic makes a bet. And the bet is that what I, the, the full, um, everything I know is somehow or other bigger and more important than everything I don't know. So if it doesn't fit with what I know, I'm not going to entertain it. I'm not going to investigate it. As the skeptic matures, he or she sees that that's probably a very bad bet. Because as Donald Rumsfeld says, there are the things you know, the things you don't know, and the things you don't know you don't know. <laughs> um, I'm a psychoanalyst. I also think that there are the things that you know that you don't know you know. Uh, that those are the unconscious <laughs> things. But anyway, stick with uh, Donald Rumsfeld. You realize that what you know does not exhaust everything that's out there. And so the mature skeptical response is to say, given that I don't know the thing out there and what I know now is inadequate, there's really only one thing you can do, which is investigate it rather than dismiss it. Or say, I don't know, and just stop there. But the immature skeptic is, it likes to just say, dismiss it, and then ridicule it. So what I did is I immersed myself. And so I spent you know, seven years following people at the Listening Center in Toronto. And I, I followed two dozen patients. Um, and some of them I referred. So I could, you know, there wasn't just cream skimming. And I saw people getting better over and over. Um, and the number that didn't was fairly small because the assessment there was you know, really very thorough. And then I said, OK, K 
can I reverse engineer how this is possible? Can I figure out, based on what I've learned about plasticity and the operating of operations of the brain, could this make any sense? And then I, that's where the book isn't just a book of stories, it's weaving in science. Um, and there are a lot of control studies in the book. There are tons of them. Mm -hmm. um, but the control studies of treatments come very late in the game. So you have a hunch or an anomaly, something that doesn't make sense, and you start wondering about it. And then you try to do an intervention. And then you do the initial testing, and you get a lot of clinical experience, and you refine your technique. And then maybe there's that first study, and then maybe there's a number of studies. And when you work at the cutting edge, where, where I do, where I, where I am spending a lot of time observing, um, there may not always be treatment studies. But for instance, in the Parkinson's thing, um, there, are, there are a lot of studies of exercise in Parkinson's. In fact, you know, the neuro Pepper's neurologist, Jody Pearl, said, you know, he was ahead of us. Now, there's a reason why I think it's legitimate to talk about these cases, even though sometimes there aren't large group studies. First of all, large group studies um, often have, there are great strengths to them and there are also flaws to them. They, they often have to take people who are very, very different with different histories, nervous systems, and genetics and try to blur it together. And I think that in, in neurology and psychiatry, the single case history looked at in depth is very, very important. Um, but by, by studying these, these single cases, you, you learn a lot. It's so funny because um, sometimes people say, well, where's the you know, long-term randomized clinical trial for, for this particular intervention? And it may not have been done yet, but clinical neurologists actually, if you read neurology textbooks, they love individual cases. The, the, they love Phineas Gage and that they, we learned about the frontal lobes from a single man who had a, ten, a, a, a rod that was, unfortunately for, for him, thrust up through his frontal lobes, and he had a change of character. Or the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things that I, I say just very early on in the book, and, and it just goes with this kind of territory, um, because I do describe people who are getting better um, and who have illnesses you know, where most people are not getting better in mainstream treatment. Um, but I'm not trying to say this is miraculous. I never do it. I try to use science to explain it, make it unmiraculous. And the focus does, this focus doesn't advocate naively replacing the neurological nihilism of the past with an equally extreme neurological utopianism. We're replacing false pessimism with false hope. To be valuable, discoveries of new ways of healing the brain do not have to guarantee that all patients can be helped all the time. And often, we simply don't know what will happen until the person, with the guidance of a knowledgeable health professional, gives the new approaches a try. Because the new approaches, all but one, Never have side effects. What the person stands to lose is their time and the cost of, of the treatment. So in the ab in, where there is not a, a, a large study, I wear two hats. There's the side of me that did research training at the National Institute of Mental Health in Columbia combined. And it wants to know what, what treatments work for whom uh, when and so on. And there's a side of me that's a clinician with a patient in front of me. Mm -hmm. And if I have one of these people, or and not just me, I mean the people in the book who have tried all the mainstream and complementary approaches and it hasn't helped them, I have to think, okay, what's best for this autistic child? Um, we wait and they're being bullied and they're, you know, they're psychologically being tormented and falling away from their peers and this, that, and the other thing. Or because there's something available here in Toronto that's helped a number of children that I've seen, do I make the referral? Um, 
I, I don't think that's a tough call um, in that situation. If someone is, is doing a simultaneous control study where some of them go to, let's say, the listening center and some of them get a bogus treatment, um, be my guest. But I'll, I'll tell you, I've done psychiatry 30, for 30 years and there will not be a lot of parents signing their children up for the control position condition. Hmm. And that doesn't mean the treatment doesn't work. It's just that all forms of studies, I mean, I was just speaking with a man named Peter Elwood. Peter Elwood is at the Cochrane Institute um, in Cardiff, Wales. And that institute is named after a man named Archibald Cochrane. And Archibald Cochrane was the person who more than any other other is considered the father of evidence-based medicine. And you know, the champion of randomized control trials. And I was talking with this you know, very senior physician who's headed 30-year studies about randomized control trials. And I said to him sheepishly, you know, you know some, of, some of these people are saying that the only way we can decide whether a treatment is, is feasible is a randomized con control, double blind, double blind control study. And he just laughed at that. He said, I know they say that, but sometimes those studies are not necessary. Sometimes they're not feasible, and sometimes they're not the ideal approach. I mean, he just completed a, a cohort study, a very different kind. The people at the top of the evidence-based medicine movement, they're not walking around just saying the same thing over and over again. Where's the randomized control style of this, that, and the other thing? They're subtle thinkers. Yeah. So do you get the feeling when you talk to people in the Western medical tradition that, I mean, because you're talking about things that would require some pretty radical rethinking of the toolkit that we have for you know, Parkinson's, for MS, for all these conditions, for, um, is this type of message being heard or is there resistance from the Western medical tradition? How, what's your read on that? I think it, it varies. I think it goes field by field. Physiotherapy is interested in it. Uh, parts of psychiatry are very interested in it. Um, I, younger neurologists seem more interested in it. Um, you well, know, your, your experience determines... Um, if you see an autistic child or someone with, let's say, a stroke, I mean, this, is ha this happens every day right now still. People are getting six weeks of physiotherapy, maybe eight weeks of physiotherapy for stroke, uh, even though we, we now know that certain kinds of physiotherapy and intensive work can take people much further. I mean, as we're right now in many time zones, patients are being told that um, we'll give you six to eight weeks of physiotherapy, then you're on your own. Where you are six months or a year out is where you will be, and the progress you will make between um, six months and a year or now and a year will be minimal. I hear that all the time. It's still going on. Um, and of course, if you make that recommendation to patients, that's, they won't make progress. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I, it's done in good faith, but it's very hard for doctors, you know, it's like, it's these big steamships um, that are, you know, have to turn around very, very slowly um, there's so many pressures on doctors, but it's just people have no idea how pressured family doctors are and doctors by, you know, what the insurance will reimburse, the demands of the hospital. Um, nothing is more in the short term time efficient than having a red hot prescription pad. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And writing that thing very quickly. All of these interventions are time intensive. Uh, they involve teaching the patients, and um, so th th there's, I, I must say that rehabilitation, referrals to intensive rehabilitation are less than I would have hoped for. But you know, rehabilitation in many places has been radically transformed, and there was an article by, I believe his name is Robert McCrum, uh, in the Observer this weekend. He had a stroke about 20 years ago, and he described what I had seen, which is if you go to a rehabilitation hospital 
even 20 years ago, it was just a, oh, it was a disaster. It was a place filled with despair. The staff felt despair. Uh, many of the patients felt despair. And now there's a new optimism in those institutions mm. because of plasticity. Right. So won't you please join me in thanking Norman Thank Deutsch. Thank you. Thank you.